Hello, I'm Steve Olson, the manager of training services for Mesa. This is another video in my series where I'm talking about generative design for three axis milling. In this video, we're actually ready to create the CNC toolpaths for the generative design outcome that was created from our study. So here is the arm that was created from our study. If you haven't watched the other videos, this is part of an LCD mount that would hold a LCD TV to the screen to to a wall. So we've got our results here and I'm going to jump into my manufacturer environment and I'm going to go ahead and create a setup. If you remember when I created the study, if you watch that video, I said one of my setups would be the Z positive. So basically that's what I'm looking at here where the Z is actually one of my setup directions. So I can get into all the stock and things like that just for the sake of kind of getting to the tool pass. I'm going to kind of just not worry about the stock so much. Just let it be the relative box size. I do want to set up a stock point here so I have a good reliable point to start my program from. But I'll just leave the, the stock as being as is. I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And again, with the I could also create a fixture here. Uh, if I was doing this for a real program, I would go through those steps. Here, I just want to get to the point where I'm cutting the, the uh, tool pass or creating those. So I'm kind of cutting some corners here versus what I would do for a real job. So kind of thinking about what I want to do here is normally we would do a facing operation. But because I have a lot of material here to to clear out, maybe in a, a 3D adaptive clearing would be just as good of a starting point. So I'm going to go to 3D adaptive clearing. And I'm going to go ahead and pick a tool. And it's, I've got a lot of material to clear out first because of the way this arm is compared to my stock. So I'm going to go to my tool library here and I'm going to pick a flat end mill. And size wise, Kind of up to you how big or small you want to go with first. We can maybe even go with a one inch mill. Here's a one inch and mill that looks pretty good. Say select. And then geometry wise, yeah, that looks all right. Height wise, I don't want to go all the way to the bottom. I think we're going to end up having two different sides here. So what I would do here, this part is actually two inches thick. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my my bottom height up to 0.9 from the bottom. So I'm just a little bit past halfway. That little orange line right there is the plane that signifies the symmetry plane. So we'll go just a little bit past that. I don't think that'll be too big of a problem. And looking at my passes, I can leave some stock, which would be just fine. I'm going to say order by area. When I've kind of went through this one initially and kind of played around with things, I notice it would go into this hole, come out, cut some here, go into this hole, and then repeat that process again. It seemed like it was just a lot of wasted movement. So I can tell it to cut this one all the way down, cut this area all the way down, and then cut all this way. It'll be a little bit better. The optimal load here you'll see is in red. Adaptive clearing is trying to be a ratio of the tool diameter. So you can see right now it's, it's one, which is the entire tool diameter, which is not a good idea for our optimal load. I'm going to right click in here and say edit expression and I'll say tool diameter and I'll say times 0.2 or 20% or 15% whatever you think is a good setting if you've got one that you really like we can go ahead and use that I think that's everything I want to do here I'll say okay And there is our initial toolpath. Now, uh, actually here, the first time I did this, I did it with a half inch uh, mill as opposed to a, a one inch. You can see it's a little bit too big for these holes here, which I don't know if that's too big of a problem. I was going to come back with a quarter just to be a little bit more akin to the mill size we picked in the general design. So what I was going to do here is I was going to go to my adaptive, tell it to create a derived operation, 3D milling, we'll say adaptive clearing. This time I'll pick a quarter inch end mill. I 
I'm saying that one looks pretty good. And geometry, we're going to use rest machining and we're going to tell it to actually machine cusps if it sees any. And, and we don't necessarily, well, we'll leave the stock contours on. Here, my optimal load is messed up again. I'll edit the expression. Order by area is still turned on. Stock to leave, point, point 0.2 is fine. We'll let that generate. As that last toolpath was generating, I noticed it was actually creating toolpaths in here, which would have been something the previous operation cleared up. And I realized that my rest machining was set to from stock set or set up stock, not uh, from previous operations. So I went back in, changed that. I'll say okay here, and then it should do a little bit, it should do a lot better job of keeping that middle area clear and not having to do as many operations because we did a one inch diameter clearing operation already. So now that we've got those two adaptive clearings taken care of, let's take a look now at doing say the parallel with a ball end mill that's going to really get the detail in the area between those two arms. So I'm going to do is I'm going to go into 3D, I'm going to go to Parallel, and I'm going to go to Select. So let's see what we can find in terms of a ball end mill. We'll use the diameter of, again, it was a quarter inch is what we told the generative design study to use. So here is a ball end mill. Now one thing that we'll find here is that the flute length here on this one is 0.75. We told the generative design study that our tool was going to have a shoulder length of 1.6. So we're going to have to basically pick this tool and modify it so we can then uh, have that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this tool, but I'm going to then go back in and tell it to modify it. Because that, that first tool it was in the library, and then basically by selecting it, it copies it into this file so I can make changes without really modifying the, the actual one in the library. So my flute length, let's make that 1.6. We'll make our shoulder length 1.6. Length below holder, obviously should be, we'll go with 1.6875. Overall length, if I feel I need to adjust that, I can. I mean, again, these values have to be derived from a tool that you plan on using. Here, this is just I'm playing around. I'm kind of just, you know, I could use whatever tool I want. But whenever it comes to your tools, you want to make sure you're actually using things that actually exist in your machine. So I'll accept that one. I'll select. Geometry-wise... Really not a whole lot to worry about here. Height-wise, what I'll do is to keep it from maybe adjusting things or hitting these faces out here, especially because there's still stock there, which I should have used a horizontal toolpath to kind of clear that off. It's really, I'm just kind of trying to save some time and cut some corners here so we can get to the real meat of what I'm trying to show you. So here, uh, instead of stock top, I'm going to change this to a selection and pick the top of that one. That way, it's going to stay basically between this face and what we've defined as our bottom, which actually got reset. So I'm going to say it is the model bottom, but also 0.9 inches above that. So I've still got that just past halfway idea there. Passes, the step over is too big. So it's a, since we're using a, a ball and mill, we want to think about how much of a cusp we want to have and what that, that value is going to be. Let's go with maybe. Since this is a quarter, let's go with maybe a sixteenth. And let's see here. One thing I forgot to check on the geometry tab here was we want to use that rest machining from previous operations. The first time I did this, I didn't really think about ignoring the cusps, and it, I didn't get a very, I didn't get the tool path I expected. I got very little cutting done. And I was like, oh, wait a second. I want to machine the cusp, I want to get rid of those. So I had to change that setting and then I got a lot closer to what I expected. 
Uh, everything else, we'll kind of just try these defaults and see what we get. Say OK. And we'll see what this, this toolpath looks like. Interesting enough, even though I said that this was my top height, it still actually tried to machine some stuff on that level. So I have a couple different options here. If I go into the toolpath again, I could change that top height. If you look, nothing inside that middle region really is close to that upper edge. So I could just say, when I offset that down, say minus 0 0.01 or something like that, just to move it down a little bit. I'm going to cancel that operation because another thing I could do, and this is something I've done in the past, is if I go back to my design space, I can create a sketch say on this face here, and I'll project in, say, this edge, and this edge. Then I can draw a rectangle between those two edges. And I can use that sketch as a boundary and tell it just to stay inside of that region. So I'm going to go back over to my generative, not generative design, Steve. I want to go back to the manufacturing workspace. So now that I'm back in manufacturing, if I edit this parallel, on my Geometry tab, I can say I want to make a boundary selection. Select that rectangle. Somehow I got this over here too. That looks a little bit better. And tell it to stay inside the boundary. Say OK. And that should be a little bit better to what we're looking for. That's a little bit better. And so one of the things that I've kind of grown to do over the years is that I'll kind of do one like a parallel and then maybe do a parallel the opposite direction or maybe do like a scallop. And actually today I was kind of reading some things and it said that the morphed, is it, I believe it's the morph spiral, does a really good job of dealing with these organic shapes. So I was like, you know what, maybe I'll try the, the morph spiral. But since the settings are really mostly the same, I like to do the create derive operation and then I'll say morph spiral. The really cool thing about the derived operation is that it tries to map as many things as it can from one tool, the toolpath I'm deriving into the other. So I don't have to, you know, remember all these things I did on one. It will actually copy most of them for me. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, okay, I want the same tool. I pretty much want the same boundary. I just want a slightly different path to try to get rid of more of those cusps that we have. And you can see I'm getting a lot of retractions here. So what I probably could do is tell it to use minimum retraction. And that should work out a little bit better for us. Okay, so just to kind of give you an idea of, you know, what we've got, we've got a good one side. I've done the complete tooling on a another version. Again, whenever I do on these videos, I usually kind of work everything out first to make sure I'm not caught by surprise on anything here. So you can see I have this one setup. I created a second setup for the opposite side. And one thing that's kind of cool here, I'll show you in this one, is I was like, okay, I need the all these toolpaths pretty much in this order. I don't want to have to recreate those. So what I actually did here is I duplicated this setup. So on this setup two, then, all I really needed to do was tell it, you know, be on the other side. So here for my stock, I said you should use the from the stock from the preceding setup, 
continue with rest machining. And then I said, okay, well, my box should be this corner here. So I said, I want to be the Z and the X and everything looks good there. So I say, okay, now, obviously all these tool paths probably need to be regenerated. Some of them might have some, some odd settings. If I hit generate here, see what happens. Uh, I know the last time I did it, I had a, it was a facing operation or something like that. It didn't like getting flipped over. Uh, so I had to kind of monkey with it a little bit, but basically, um, that didn't work too bad. This one here says, looks like the top and bottom heights seem to got a little bit messed up here. So if I edit this, you see the tool orientation didn't get flipped over. So if I go to the tool orientation, I can Z axis. There we go. Let's see if up oh, the bottom top height here. Issue with the top height selection. Oh, it needs me to pick something new because of the way the top height was selected on the last one. And I bet the same thing happened with the more spiral. So I'm going to start by going to the height this time. See if that does anything with the tool orientation. Nope. There we go. And now it's regenerating those. But let's jump back to the one I have pre-done here and I'll kind of we'll kind of look at what the result is after the second setup here. So after I'm done with the second setup, let's just look at what this part looks like. Obviously, I didn't get the the two operations to clear out the sides. But you can see this thing looks pretty good compared to what we have before. If I actually ran one, I might decide I might need smaller step overs. This doesn't look too terribly bad, but it's kind of hard to get a good idea based off this, these simulations. But for the most part, I think we've got a pretty good start on what we, uh, what the part would actually need to be and what it needs to look like. Those parallel, the, uh, the cut, the, the scallop and the morph spiral are pretty good for doing these organic shapes and kind of getting those cleared up, especially if we use the ball end mill and the diameter that we specified in our generative design study. Well, that's all for now. Hopefully you found this information helpful and something you can apply in the near future. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email me at my email address there on the screen. And as always, thanks for watching.